G'day mates, Captain Doug here. Welcome to Houseboats 101. Unless you are planning to be a dock captain, your houseboat will have some form of propulsion designed to help move it through the water. In this episode, we will examine the engines typically found on a houseboat and how to maintain them. We will look at the main drive engines and outdrives and generator. We'll also observe some maintenance being performed on these systems. Some you can do yourself and some you leave to the experts. I have split this episode into three main areas. Drive power, the engines and outdrives, power generation, the generator and alternator, and finally, some maintenance of these systems. If you plan to leave your boat at the dock all of the time, which is frankly a waste of a resource, you may not be very interested in this episode, or you just want to confirm that you're right in thinking all of this is too complicated and I'm going to stay at the dock. However, just like when driving a car, it's a good idea to have some understanding of how it works. Having a broad knowledge of the mechanical systems of your boat can only help in your fun with the machine. We'll start by looking at the drive power in the boat. This is the main engines and what they use to push the boat through the water. Unless your houseboat has a mast and sails, which I doubt, you're going to have one of four types of propulsion. Outboard motors, I.O. or inboard outboard drives, inboards, and another type of inboard drive called a V-drive. Outboard motors are a viable propulsion system to use on a houseboat. While they tend to be confined to smaller houseboats, they do have a number of advantages, along with a few disadvantages. The advantages of an outboard system are as follows. Outboards tend to take up less space on a boat than a typical inboard design. Outboards will weigh less than an inboard. Outboards can be raised out of the water on some houseboats. Outboards are generally less expensive than inboard engines. Outboards tend to require less work to winterize. The disadvantages of outboards can be summarized as follows. Since the engine is out in the open, you get all the noise directly from it. Outboards would use more fuel per mile than an inboard engine. And the biggest problem, outboards will take away space from any swim platform. All other drive systems we'll examine in this episode have the engines located in a separate drive bay inside the hull of the boat. The first type and most common type used on larger houseboats is the I.O. I.O. stands for inboard outboard, where the engine is mounted inside and the drive unit with the propeller is mounted outside the boat. I.O. drives have advantages and disadvantages, just like outboards. Some of the advantages. Because the engine, the thing that makes all the noise, is located in an engine bay, inboards are generally quieter when operating. Modern inboard engines with electronic fuel injection are about as fuel efficient as you can get on water, unless you have sails, that is. Inboard engines are usually a marinized car or truck engine with a well-established history and they last a long time. I.O. drives steer the boat by moving the whole outdrive to the left or right to steer the boat, giving much more responsive steering. Inboards will allow full use of the back end of the boat for a swim platform. And now for the disadvantages. An I.O. drive will be heavier than most outboard systems. Obviously, 
you will need an engine bay to hold the engine. Since the outdrive can't be tilted up out of the water like an outboard, it is subject to corrosion, particularly in salt or brackish water. I've included inboard engines because they're just a type of drive, but I've never seen one on a houseboat. Inboard engines are invariably situated well inside the hull of a boat, with a long drive shaft that runs from the engine to the outside of the boat where the propeller is attached. The design of most houseboats does not lend itself to this arrangement, so let's rule out the straight inboard system. So, some manufacturers came up with the idea of a V-drive, this design seeks to remove the need to have the engine located well inside the boat by folding the drive shaft into a V by using a special transmission between the engine and the propeller. Of course, there are pros and cons to this type as well. Just like a regular inboard, the V drive aims to have the propeller as the only thing outside the boat subject to corrosion. Unlike the pure inboard, the V-drive allows the engine to be mounted in a stern-located engine bay. This allows a V-drive to have a full swim platform. Unfortunately, V-drives also require external rudders to steer the boat, which are less responsive than outdrives. Most houseboat manufacturers have now settled on the I.O. drive as the drive of choice. Since most larger houseboats, including this one, have chosen to use I.O. drives, let's now look at the main engines. There are two main choices when it comes to powering your houseboat. What size of engine and what type of fuel. Our boat has two 5-litre Mercruiser V8 engines each producing about 270 horsepower. My first houseboat, the 1987 Somerset, was not so lucky and was powered by two four-cylinder engines, each only producing about 120 horsepower. Newer houseboats, say those built after 2010, may have V6 engines. It basically comes down to how much power you need to push a houseboat along in the water. From my experience, it doesn't take a lot of power to move a houseboat, unless you're stuck on a beach or a sandbar. Then the power of a V8 can definitely help. There's also the choice of a single engine or twin engine on a houseboat. Let me just say, besides the built-in redundancy of having two engines, a two-engine houseboat can actually pivot around its engines. I'll explain how that works when we get out on the water. As for fuel, your choices are gas or diesel. Each of these fuels have advantages and disadvantages. Availability. Usually both types of fuel are available. However, at our fuel dock, there are three gas pumps, but only one diesel pump. Some inland lakes seem to have a preference one way or the other, but availability should not be an issue. Consistency. Here I mean that if you have diesel main engines, you are going to want to have a diesel generator and vice versa. If your main engines are gasoline, your generator will most likely be gasoline. I believe it's quite rare to have a mix of fuels between your engines. Diesel engines are going to cost a lot more. In fact, a typical size diesel for a houseboat will cost up to three times as much as a gasoline engine. Gasoline wins here. Diesel engines are noticeably noisier than gasoline engines. High combustion pressure in a diesel engine will just make more noise. Gasoline wins again. Obviously, gasoline is more dangerous than diesel as a fuel type. However, modern houseboats are built to rigorous ABYC standards for fuel handling and distribution. But we'll give this one to diesel. Carbon monoxide, very dangerous stuff. All the combustion engines create carbon monoxide while running. However, diesel engines produce much less CO than gasoline engines. 
This can be a bigger issue when we come to the generator. So I'll talk about that more when we look at the generator. Suffice it to say, from a main engine point of view, CO generated by main engines under normal operating conditions is probably not a consideration, but diesel gets this one. It's a common belief that diesel engines will last much longer than gasoline engines. While this might be true in cars and trucks, in boats, diesel engines have to work a lot harder and come under more stress, so the difference is not as much. Still, diesel by a slight edge. Pound for pound, a gasoline engine will develop more horsepower than a diesel engine. There is just more energy in gasoline fuel than diesel fuel. Also, gasoline engines with their cast aluminum components and lower compression ratios will just be lighter. Gasoline by a hair. Sorry, diesel. There are two types of cooling systems on inboard engines. Both of them use sea or lake water to varying degrees. Some internal drive engines, particularly those in salt or brackish water, use a closed cooling system. This is where the engine uses standard antifreeze coolant circulating through a heat exchanger, much the same as an automobile. However, in a marine application, raw water from the lake or sea is pumped through the heat exchanger instead of air. The other type is a raw water system. This is where raw water from the lake, river or sea is pumped directly through the engine to remove heat. There are advantages and disadvantages in both systems. In a closed system, water is not passing through the engine itself. So in salt or brackish water, potentially corrosive coolant is not inside the engine block. Secondly, a closed system allows the engine to run at a higher temperature. I know this seems counterintuitive when we are talking about cooling, but internal combustion engines run more efficiently when they're hot. Finally, running antifreeze coolant through your engine reduces the chance of a frozen block in the colder climates. A closed system requires two coolant pumps, one to pump raw water from the outside of the boat and another to circulate coolant through the engine and heat exchanger. A raw water system has one raw water pump. While having a heat exchanger in a closed system potentially reduces corrosion with the engine itself, the heat exchanger is particularly sensitive to corrosion and requires an anode or cathode to minimize this. In a closed system, the antifreeze coolant must be replaced at regular intervals to maintain its properties. A boat, by definition, spends most of its life in the water. This has two effects on the fuel in the system. Firstly, gasoline that sits for months in a fuel tank can go bad. It might be surprising to some, but untreated gasoline really only has a shelf life of three to six months. You notice I said untreated. There are additives you can put in the fuel to help stop the gasoline from aging. I use an additive called seafoam in my fuel tanks. Secondly, it's the water environment. Water in the air can get absorbed by the gasoline over time. Ever wonder why marinas only sell non-ethanol gas? It's because gasoline with ethanol draws in water from the air which can corrode the fuel tanks and reduce the performance of the engine. Keeping the fuel tanks full can help by minimising the amount of air the fuel comes in contact with. Also, most, if not all, marine engines will have a fuel water separating filter in their fuel lines. These do need to be replaced now and then. Now, let's look at power generation. Our boat has a 15 kilowatt gasoline Westerbeek generator. This is basically a four cylinder engine coupled to an AC alternator. 
The engine uses a speed governor to keep it running at a constant speed no matter what happens to the load on the alternator. This is needed because the alternator must run at a constant speed of 1800 RPM to produce the AC voltage at 60 cycles, the frequency required by all the appliances and electrical systems on the houseboat. The engine uses a closed cooling system where raw water from the lake passes through the heat exchanger and coolant flows around the engine itself. Being a 2001 model, our houseboat still has the side exhaust. Later model boats will have a type called a dry stack exhaust. Exhaust from our generator engine goes through a Vernalift muffler where it is mixed with raw cooling water and then finally pushed out the side by exhaust pressure. From 2002 onwards, houseboat manufacturers installed dry stack exhaust systems to minimize the collection of carbon monoxide around the boat when it's stationary. These systems direct the exhaust gases up a pipe at the stern to above the top deck. They still use a Vernalift muffler to push out the cooling water on the side, but separate out the exhaust gases and send them up a vertical pipe. If you have or get a boat with a diesel generator, the problem of carbon monoxide is much reduced, which was one of the advantages of diesel fuel. I've decided to include three maintenance tasks in this episode. Oil changes, impeller changes, and outdrive servicing. Oil in the engines should be changed every 100 hours of operation or every 12 months, whichever occurs first. Pump impellers push cooling water through your engines and they do wear out. I recommend changing every two years. If one fails, that engine will be out of service and you don't want that happening while you're away from the dock. Outdrives on houseboats are normally not accessible for service while the boat is in the water. The rule of thumb here is every five to 10 years, or as one marine mechanic told me, when they break. When we're going to do an oil change, what we really have to do is warm the engines up because in this cold weather, the uh, oil in the bottom of the engine will get very sluggish and hard to pull out of the engine. So I'm going to start the engines up now. Once the engines have been running for a few minutes, they should be warmed up enough. We can then turn them off an important thing to do if you're actually going to take off the oil filter and then we can start our oil change. Well the first thing we've got to do is get in the engine bay. We'll see how that goes. Ah. Well that was the hardest part of this process. Well before we start you need to assemble all the equipment that you're going to need to do an oil change a handy little funnel, the new oil filter, a filter wrench in case the one getting off is a little hard, nice big bottle of oil, I use 20W50 on these engines because the temperature in the engine bay can get quite hot in summer with two engines running, a nice big pile of dirty old rags because this is the day of the greasy hands and last of all this handy little gadget that will suck the oil out of the engine. Okay first of all we're going to pull out the dipstick and have a look at the oil that's on there and if you see that it's not too bad actually it's uh, fairly clear and it's up to the uh, okay range. Use one of our dirty old rags to wipe that off because we don't want to get oil all over our carpet out here. Okay I showed you my handy little uh, vacuum pump here and it comes with these tubes 
these tubes can actually be used to fit down where the oil dipstick came out from. And uh, to do that, you have to pick the right size for your oil dipstick. They will push all the way down. Now, unlike a car, you can't get underneath the engine to drain the oil out from the bottom because it's in the boat and there's no way of getting up underneath unless you take a big swim. So what we've got to do is we've got to actually suck the oil out through the dipstick tube and put it into this fancy tube. Now, there are two ways we can do that. This is the way I prefer. It has this little cap on the end that can actually screw on to the dipstick tube. This actually will screw onto the top of the dipstick tube. These dipstick tubes actually come with a flange on the top that's threaded for this particular fitting. Very nice, eh? Next, we have to connect this tube that I just screwed on the dipstick tube into an extension tube for our vacuum pump. Once we've done that, we can then take our vacuum tube thingy here and we can plug this into the top of that, like that, and bring the whole thing down closer to the engine. We then start pumping here and it creates a vacuum inside that tube and I don't know if you can see it but here comes the oil along the tube being pulled out and it's going to go down into our vacuum pump and you can see why I ran the engines a little bit because if the oil was really thick it's not going to flow very well. You've got to pump it uh, probably 10 to 15 times to create a good vacuum and make sure the oil is flowing down into the vacuum tube and then we can just leave it and now comes the easier part we just sit around and wait for the oil to fill up into that tube once you start to see bubbles coming through the pipe you know that you've sucked out all the oil you'll actually hear it bubbling and gurgling you want to release the pressure on the vacuum pump by pushing down on the little valve at the top and then start to undo this cap off the uh, dipstick tube. And you'll notice I put one of my handy little rags around here in case some oil drips out. Once you've undone the cap off the dipstick tube, you can pull out the tube from the vacuum pump and carefully hand it to your assistant on the dock so you don't get oil dripping down into the boat or on the carpet. So we can now take out our vacuum pump and you can see we pulled out about uh, four and two thirds litres, one, two, three, four. And it's time to remove the oil filter from the engine. I'm going to wrap some of my handy dirty rags around here because the way they have the oil filter on these engines, it's sitting vertically and once you start undoing it, a little bit of oil is going to leak out around the side. You don't want it running down the engine. So I tuck these in like this to try and catch any of the oil that might drip out. And we're now ready to undo this, hopefully, yep, using the There we go. Before you actually take the oil filter off, what you need to do is have assembled the old box where the new oil filter came in and a nice plastic bag to contain any oil that might drip out of it. And you can also put a few of our handy little dirty old rags around here as well. Because I'm going to transfer this from here into here. Okay, now we're ready to put new oil back in the engine. You do not want to forget this step. You'd be trying to run your engine without oil. So you take off the oil cap here with your filler and get your handy little funnel. I use that because I don't want to try and pour oil all over the place. And hopefully this will go in all right. And we start filling it up. 
Okay, you noticed that I used the whole bottle of the oil because this says it holds five US quarts. And judging by this, we took out about four and a half. So, or just over four and a half. What we didn't take out into here was what was in the old oil filter. So when you add that in, we're probably at five. You don't want to overfill the engine, that's for sure. So before we do anything else, once, once we're ready to clean up, we'll check the oil level in the engine using the dipstick. Okay, so we're going to check the oil level with the dipstick. These dipsticks are really long. So you've got to feed it down, make sure it doesn't kink up on itself. Put it all the way down. Give it a minute. And now pull it out. And, yep. Our oil is reading high because we haven't started the engine to fill the oil filter yet. So I think we'll still be okay. All right, the generator is now nice and warm and we're going to do the oil change on the generator. That was a lot easier getting down here with these stairs than it is climbing down into one of those engines. We've assembled all our handy stuff that we need. We've got our bottle of oil. In this case, I'm using 10W40. We've got our tiny little oil filter, which I checked to make sure that it was the right type for the generator. I've got this, it's not going to work because the oil filter is way too small. So it's going to be a hand job and rags. And I've got my dirty old rags and I've got my vacuum pump. And I've got another type of tube. Last, when I did the engines, the main engines, I used the one that could screw onto the dipstick. This uh, Westerbeek engine does not have that flange at the top of the dip dipstick tube. so you've got to use one that can actually push down the tube. So that's this one. First thing, of course, we want to pull out our dipstick and have a look at the uh, oil level on the dipstick. And again, it's up near the full mark and it looks really nice and clean. We'll see how clean it is when we pull out the old oil. First of all, we have to connect our new tube that'll go down the dipstick tube onto our tube that goes to our vacuum pump with these connectors and now we're ready to get our vacuum pump and I'm going to bring that down here plug one end into the vacuum pump and the other end has to go into the dipstick tube now I've got to find the dipstick tube on the Westerbeaks, they're right down under the exhaust manifold and if the engine is hot, so is the exhaust manifold. I push the tube down as far as I can. I hope it hasn't sort of coiled back up on itself and now we're ready to start pumping. And you can see once I start pumping, the oil starts coming through the tube and down into the vacuum pump. What I did find was that I'd pushed the uh, tube into the dipstick too far and I think it had gone down maybe and come up out of the oil again down there so it started just sucking the air. And once we've pumped it up a few times it's time to wait for the oil to fill up into the vacuum pump. Once you start seeing the bubbles come up really pushing through that tube you'll know that you've reached the bottom of the oil and it's finished sucking. Okay, so once we've got all our bubbles, I'm going to press this valve to release the air into the vacuum pump. Let the oil drain back down into the engine. Okay, Westerbeaks, for some reason, decide to put their oil filter on the side of the engine, which means when you take the oil filter off, oil is going to leak out of the filter and run down the side of the engine. So what I'm going to do is stuff some of my rags under here to catch that oil. I don't want it running down in the engine, although that, that should be 
Okay, box there ready to catch the new filter. The old filter with the oil drips out everywhere. Thank you, Westerbeek. And I'll slot that down in there and try and mop off any oil that's come out. All right, so first of all, we put a bit of oil around the gasket here. Then we can start screwing this back onto the engine. And just hand tight should be enough. We'll check when we start the engine that it is tight enough and no oil's running out the side. And finally, I'm going to get a pen and write on there the date and the number of hours. So I've got my trusty funnel. I'm going to take the cap off the oil filler, put that on here and now get my bottle of oil. I still have some left over from the last oil change so I'm going to use this up first and then we'll start with the new one. Once we've done that we can Build up the oil, we can put the cap back on and we want to test the level of the oil in the engine, make sure everything's okay. And let the engine sit for a few minutes so that the oil has, has had time to drain down to the bottom of the engine because that's where the dipstick's measuring. And we pull it out now and it's a bit hard to see but the oil is up here and it's good. We're finished.
Unfortunately, I don't have video of an actual outdrive service being performed on a houseboat. There are many videos on YouTube showing outdrives being serviced, and I would encourage anyone interested in viewing them. Doing any maintenance on the outdrives nearly always requires having the boat pulled out of the water. For a boat 80 feet long, this requires a special tractor trailer and expert handling. Well, that's it for our look at the various engines on a houseboat. Join us in episode six, when we will cover engine controls, steering systems, and thrusters. Cheers, mates.